now that you've met our cast, may we proudly present the man in charge of the evening's entertainment. Here he is, your host. You know how to hear me a host. Must have got me mixed up with Loretta Young. Uh, a good guy for the job would be Carl Reiner. Yes, that's true, but I couldn't take the job because it would cause a lot of trouble. You see, the host introduces people and then leaves the stage, and people resent it terribly any time I leave a stage. Uh, a good man for the job, I think, would be Mel Brooks. Well, actually, I'd be perfect. I'm kind of handsome, and I have faultless diction, but there's a little problem. I'm a bit of a nut. Watch. <laughs> you can't do that. I think a better one for the job would be my doctor, Dr. Joyce Brothers. Me as hostess, I couldn't do this program. My job is to help solve problems, not to create them. I'd suggest Kay Stevens. Oh, I'd love to be the hostess, but I couldn't. I'm wearing sport clothes. <laughs> Come on, Carl, no, you've got to no, do not it. not me. No, somebody else. I can't. Somebody else. Well, then who? No. For a host, you, 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 you've no. got to get the right type. A fellow who won't offend anybody. A colorless personality. But it should be neat. And not too bright. Neutral. A real loser. Yeah, well, where are we going to find a joke like that? Hi there. This is, this is your host, Johnny Colorless, neutral, neat, not too bright. A real loser, Carson. Good evening. Our uh, show tonight puts the uh, accent on comedy in various moods and uh, various styles. Now, we did research, delved into archives, and put together a complete all-inclusive survey of comedy through the ages. But in rehearsal, as often happens, you see the program run a little long. So we had to cut a few things here and there, such as slapstick comedy during the Ming Dynasty. Uh, we hated to lose. And uh, also, we had to lose a wonderful segment on situation comedy during the Spanish Inquisition. But those things happen. You see, we couldn't cover everything, so we cut our show down to an hour. So to get things started tonight, let's go back about uh, 50 years. Now, half a century ago, a new form of home entertainment appeared in America. This is it right here. This is a gramophone. And uh, believe me, it was a thing of wonder. Because uh, aside from the beautiful voices of the great opera stars, you could also hear, believe it or not, comedians on records. Now, since that time, we've had uh, comedy in vaudeville and silent pictures and talking pictures, of course, in television. And now in 1962, although the old phonograph has become the hi-fi stereo with the tweeters and the woofers, guess what we're back to? Comedy on records. And this is one of the biggest sellers of them all, Carl Reiner and Mel Brooks. Listen. Good evening. Each year, millions of Americans, by not taking allowable deductions, spend more on their income tax than is necessary. Mr. Philip J. Hanker has written a book to help uh, us. That's uh, Hanker. Hanker. I'm sorry. No, no, wait, wait, you're right. It's Hanker. I'm sorry. Oh, you were right. Well, Mr. Hanker. Mr. Hanker, you have written a book called yes. Taxes, Taxes, Taxes. What do they want from us? Yes. And in this book, you are going to tell people how to save money on their income tax. Now, for instance, sir, may I use a hypothetical case? You certainly may. Uh, Mr. Hiker, a man making $100,000 a year in income, what would he pay to his government in taxes normally? $90,000. Now, using the Philip J. Hiker method, how much would he pay? $1.40. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's rather low. How do you arrive at such a low figure? by enormous miscalculation. <laughs> Just a moment, you mean you make mistakes? Yes, we make mistakes. In addition and subtraction? Well, we carry things over, we drop a few things. Who has to know? Well, the government checks these things. Well, they? what is accounting but a gigantic financial ping-pong game between you and your government? Well, it's more than that. They get angry you when you make... You bet it is, because they catch you. I see. <laughs> well, sir, sir, now, for instance, the same man making $100,000, how much might you take off for say, entertainment? Well, it's according to his profession. Well, say he's in show business. Oh, a great deal. Well, how much? For entertainment, $62,990. That's an awful lot of money. You bet your <laughs> life. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> how can you take off so much? Well, you have to throw a party. Oh, a big, large yes. party. It's about 11 to 12 people. That's enough. For $62,000? Yes, the secret, actually, is serving shish kebab. 
I don't understand well, that. Well, shish kebab, you know, is a flame on skewers. I know that. See, let's say you have Jack Benny over at the party. You come in with the flaming skewers. You say, hi, Jack, you hit the drapes. Yes? The house goes up in flames. <laughs> you mean you burn down you your burn house? burn your house down. That's what and you, you do. Did, well, that's and rather... And you deduct 62000 That's rather dollars. drastic, isn't it? Yes, it is drastic. We have to do that sometimes. You mean actors do that? <laughs> actors sometimes do it, yes. You mean those fires in Hollywood Hills and Beverly Hills might have been, uh... mm, Probably the work of an accountant. Yes. <laughs> Well, tell me, sir, in reading your book, you have some very unusual deductions I'd like to explain. Now, under medical deductions, you deduct marriage, you see. Yes, say. I deduct marriage. How can you deduct marriage under medical? Well, marriage is a heartache. Yeah. Oh, I Take see. Off, I see. Now, you have other deductions here which I don't understand. For instance, you have a personal deduction here. What do you take off of personal deductions? Well, I take off my wife, my children, and the nation of Romania. <laughs> you deduct... The entire nation? Well, nobody else is claiming them. I mean, is that, is that allowed? Well, we're in court about it, but I send them things. Uh, I've sent them, you need a biscuit, and woolen socks, and chocolate pudding. And the they love chocolate pudding. And the, government, right. the government yeah. is going to allow that? Well, the government yells, and then you stop. See, well, Romania's lucky, but I don't think you're going to yes. get away with well, it. Well, Romania's sir. sending lawyers over to help me. Well, I yes. sir. <laughs> sir. Sir, under miscellaneous, you have an item called... WW2. Now, that is a, I guess, a code for a certain tax form. Now, that means World War II. You deduct for World I War II? I deducted that war, yes. How can you deduct the, for the war? Under a travel expense. The war was a travel expense? Yes. Well, the, doesn't the Army transport you? Well, in this case, I decided to go to war in my own car. <laughs> so I, uh, I used a 41 Dodge, and I and, deducted that. And they yes. allow that? Yes, the Germans didn't allow it. They shot at me. I see. Yes. Well, that's a strange deduction, sir. They knew it was an American vehicle. Now, sir, you have a, a, a charities, which everyone takes off. Yes. You have ones, I understand, the Red Cross, the Heart Association. But this one I've never heard before. It's called the Sheila Copeland Welfare and... You don't need that. Uh, <laughs> the Sheila it. Copeland Welfare no, and Happiness Fund? No, that's the deduction. Forget about it. What is that, the Sheila Copeland? It's a sick girl, a poor girl. A, a, forget it. Oh, all right. Uh, you don't want Would to talk about it. Give me a break and I, forget I, that. <laughs> Stop again. Now, I understand what you're getting at, sir. We'll scratch that out. Now, you have one deduction here which surprises me. I don't know what it means. It's called very personal deduction. Yes, I deduct my face. You deduct your face for what reason? Well, Is when it... I was born, I was a darling baby. Yes. My mother couldn't go two blocks without women saying, Oh, look at that face and pinch and stop the carriage and yell about me and say, What a beautiful baby. Yes. Now look at my face now. It's depreciated. You bet it's depreciated. <laughs> I, so I could get into a carriage. My mother could wheel me now for miles. I couldn't get arrested. Oh, I see. So you take off the I'm face. taking the carriage off, too. What do I care? <laughs> <laughs> I'm murdered. Sir, I, I'm, I'm very surprised at all this. Are you a real accountant? Uh, of course I am. I had to take the hip accountant. So... The Hippocampus oath? Yes, it's an oath for accountants. Hey, is that something like the doctors take the Hippocratic oath? Yes, but this is for accountants. What does this mean? Sir? I do that a lot of times. <laughs> Usually people don't stop me. That <laughs> I thought you had a reason. I'd like to find out because... Would you like to hear the Hippocampus oath? I'd be interested. I'm sure to... they're dying to hear I'd that. I'd like yeah. to hear it. The Hippocampus oath now. We, the Hippocampus of America, in order to form a more perfect bank book, do hereby claim that the government of the people, by the people, and for the people, is taking a lot of money away from the people. And I think that the people should open them out. You know, one of the charms of watching television in its early days, about 10 or 12 years ago, was the fact that a lot of it was live, most of it. And there was always the possibility of an actor forgetting a line or seeing a stagehand walk inadvertently into camera range, you see, during a very dramatic scene. Well, today, most of the television programs, you know, are on film. And all that fun is gone. Television is just too technically perfect. But if all television today were live, I would like to show you some of the things that I would like to see happen on television just once. Carl? Yes. Well, one of television's more staple items is the Western. See you in a minute, Carl. Certainly. <laughs> I certainly hope so. Uh, from the early days of showing Hopalong Cassidy films, the Western has grown into full hour and hour and a half programs. Now, in just a moment, we're going to see one of the most popular Western shows. Wouldn't you like to see this happen just once?
that boy dies, Art, Mr. Archer, I'm holding you personally responsible. An eye for an eye, if you will. Now, I suggest you call off your associates. Not a bad-looking fellow. We're about to see one of the more familiar scenes on television, but uh, wouldn't this be a welcome change if we saw it this way? When nasty headaches strike. <laughs> Have you ever asked yourself this question? What do doctors recommend? What do doctors recommend? When the headache comes without warning, you suffer from that ache all over feeling. You feel sluggish and nerves become taut. Now, ordinary aspirin has only one ingredient to act on that nasty headache. So here's what I often take and recommend to my patients. Professional actors are used in the majority of TV commercials, but there's another trend, using the man or woman on the street to test the product. This, of course, gives a feeling of honesty to the endorsement. Hello there. I'm standing here on the corner of 58th Street and Madison Avenue, New York, where you're about to witness an actual shaving demonstration. I'm going to stop someone at random on their way to the work, and perhaps we can show you the... Oh, excuse me, sir. Oh, uh, yes? May I have your name? Fred Random. <laughs> Mr. Random, I assume you're on your you're on your way to work, are you? You just came from home? That's right. I also assume that you uh, think you received a close, comfortable shave at home this morning with yes. your own razor? Yes, I think so. Uh -huh. Would you help me out here, Mr. Random? I want to show you, with the whismatic razor, the actual beard that your own razor missed this morning. Oh, Would I'd you mind? Be, I'd be very Step happy Step right to. up here and shave for us, will you? That's it. Just bring the razor in very close. Advertisers spend millions of dollars to find the right sales approach and often appeal to our vanity. The cigarette commercial that associates itself with a virile outdoor working man. We're about to see a man called Steve Sturgis. He's a construction foreman for a gigantic midtown project. And like most rugged individualists, Steve looks forward to his favorite smoke after a grueling day. Well, let's let this man's man speak for himself. You know, fashions change in comedy as in everything else. Years ago, a vaudevillian couldn't get a split week in Duluth if he couldn't do dialect comedy. One of the surefire acts was the Dutch comic. With a Dutch comic hat and a coat, of course, the Dutch comic nose. And then, stand back, because it was a laugh a second. <laughs> <laughs> Rudolf, Rudolf, yeah, yeah. I was walking by your house last night. Uh -huh. When I look in the window, yeah. Yeah. when I seen you kissing your wife, <laughs> the joke's on you. I wasn't home last night. <laughs> well, that, that wasn't too big a laugh. Oh, of course, they forgot the laugh insurance. Otto, Rudolph, uh, once again, gentlemen. <laughs> I was walking by your house last night. When I look in the window, when I see you kissing your wife, the joke's on you. I wasn't home last night. <laughs> that, 
<laughs> that, ladies and gentlemen, was technically known as the spritzer and the kisser and the host. But uh, times have changed. Now you get seltzer with your, uh, with your scotch instead of the jokes. But dialect comedy isn't gone, happily for us, because it's basic and it's wonderful when it's done right. Now, fortunately, we have a fellow this evening who's mastered many forms of comedy. Among them, dialect. Mr. Buddy Hackett. Thanks, John. Well, I, I could do a lot of dialects. You saw, you know, like, uh, I just finished a picture called Brothers Grimm where I do a bit of a Cockney accent. And of course, when it's coming to a Jewish tongue, I'm using my native, it's the best what you could find it. And once in a while, in the summertime, I talk like old Henry Armada, we used to do a show recipes. But for tonight, I'm going to do something at the standard of mind I've been doing for about 12 years now. It's my impression of a Chinese waiter taking an order from six people for family dinner. I use this handkerchief as a prop uh, napkin, you know. My wife is so concerned that it should be just right that with her own hands, she pick up a phone and hired a woman to wash in her hand. He said, how you do? Why you have six people? You want to have family dinner for six? You have family dinner, you have choice of soup. Then you have choice spare rib or egg roll for appetizer. Three main dish, two from column A, one from column B. Tea, rice, dessert. You want that? All right, sit down. No, come inside first. <laughs> Now we start with soup. We have one ton, chicken egg drop, two made of rice. What soup you want? One ton, one one ton, one egg drop, one egg drop, two egg drop, one one ton. You do one one ton? You one egg drop. Why you say one ton? I just want to hear yourself talk. I like to hear yourself say, oh, my eye hurts terrible. <laughs> uh, take, a, take an egg drop. It's three egg drop and no one ton. Hey, you want a one ton. This is one one ton, two egg drops. Same thing. Why you mix me up that? <laughs> you shut up, you're on another table. <laughs> no, I'm not your waiter. My name Hung. Your waiter named Fung. Got a big F on the forehead. <laughs> F on the forehead. Yeah, come to work. Boss say, what's your name? Say, my name Fung. You say, your name Fung. Bing, bang, bang. <laughs> <laughs> two egg drops, one one ton. No, we don't have a split piece up here. <laughs> what do you mean, why? Why you got a round eye like an owl? Why? <laughs> we ain't got it, that's all. We don't make a split piece soup. We don't make it, we don't have it. No, your brother didn't have a split piece here. Yeah, your brother told you he have here, but we don't give him here. No, we serve anybody. We just ain't got it, that's all. <laughs> well, your brother's a big liar. All right, have it your way. We got it. I don't want to give you. <laughs> don't holler at me. You want to argue? I call the boss. Mr. Katz! <laughs> how you like, uh, how you like to have a little souvenir? Set a chopstick in one ear out the other. Eh? Uh, take a wonton. A two wonton, three egg drop. A tomato rice, tomato rice. A two tomato rice, a two wonton, three egg drop. Six people, seven soup now. <laughs> Who ordered two soup here? No, I don't care to join you. Who ordered two soup? No, I can't eat that stuff. Give me a burn here. No, start over. Just say one soup now. No, what soup you want? You want a one ton. This one one ton? Why you say extra? No, don't order for her. Yeah, I know you brought her. Cab driver bring you all. Don't order nothing. <laughs> Now, ho, order, ho, he, he, him, him, ho, 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 and you, you. Now, what do you want just for you? One ton is shut your fat mouth now. <laughs> got a one ton, got an egg chop. What is your pleasure? Yeah, mine too, but you got to eat the soup first. <laughs> it's a tomato. Three tomato, two one ton, one egg chop. Yeah, soup finished. Now get three main dish, two from column A, one from column B. Egg fuyong, shrimp, lobster sauce. Rob's the Cantonese. You have made a splendid selection. <laughs> Except you took two from B, one from A. I say take two from A, one from B. <laughs> eight for young. Yeah. Fly lice. What's your fly lice, pray tell? <laughs> Not say fly lice, say fry rot. <laughs> fry rot. 
No make fun Chinese talk. Say, how oh, now, brown cow, you jackass talk. <laughs> Egg for young, fry rice, shrimp, lobster sauce, spare rib, and egg roll on a dinner, three tomatoes, two wonton, one egg chop. Yeah, lady, tea rice come free. <laughs> oh, beautiful brown, five feet ten, blue eye. Meet me later, get a nice ride in a rickshaw. So what's the dessert? Three almond cookies, two fortune cookies, and a stuffed kumquat. How you like me to stuff it in your eyeball? Huh? <laughs> yeah, just a minute, give the order in the kitchen. He come and sack now your home, are ya? He know a sack now I tell you more no keep ass for split pea soup, that round eye area. He come and say the stair up and across. I say, come outside, see the brown woman built like the brick wall of China. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Kitchen is closed. You took too long to order. <laughs> There's a uh, very old form of comedy that dates way back, the animated figures on strings called marionettes. Uh, marionettes happen to be a special interest of mine. I uh, used to work them as a kid and can still do it. So I hope you'll enjoy tonight some of the effects that I can create with them. Bernie Green, uh, could I have a little ballet music, please, uh, to get us started here? Marionette actually is a, a French origin. I don't know if you know that or not, uh, but actually they go. Archaeologists have discovered that marionettes go back actually as far as 300 BC, and uh, the Romans actually uh, Romans actually used them in certain plays, and in the in the medieval ages, uh, the great French philosopher Voltaire. Uh, was very active in puppets because they put on some famous French morality plays that I suppose a lot of you are familiar with. Actually, uh, as early as 1915, uh, in, uh, in Chicago, uh, Ellen von Falkenberg put on some uh, plays. with the Chicago uh, Puppeteer, Puppeteer Theater, which uh, were very effective. A lot of famous people in the... Uh... Bernie, knock it off. That stupid music, will you? <laughs> stupid ballet. I'm uh, terribly sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Apparently, these marionettes are factory seconds. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this charming lady is a well-known psychologist and television personality, Dr. Joyce Brothers. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Dr. Brothers, you know, lately, especially the past year, there have been so many magazines and books publishing articles on psychology. Uh, have there any, been any results on the average layman at all? Johnny, everybody has become an amateur psychologist. <laughs> Everybody thinks he knows all the technical terms. Yeah, I imagine that's true. I imagine that comes kind of a drag, doesn't it? You have no idea. I was at a party last week, and the hostess introduced me to the famous Dr. Hugo Oberdorfer. Oh, yeah. Dr. Oberdorfer, I've heard of him. He's the psychologist that gives green stamps, isn't he? <laughs> yes, but if there was anyone I didn't want to meet that night, it was another psychologist. Everyone needs time off from work, away from shop talk. What I wanted to meet was a simple, uncomplicated, outgoing, fun-loving... Uh, schnook. <laughs> and there he was at the party, Freddie Cooper, a hairnet manufacturer. Uh, he looks like a real good time Charlie. <laughs> From Perth Amboy, New Jersey. <laughs> he had no idea that you were a psychologist. None at all. So I ducked Dr. Oberdorfer and I told Freddie I'd meet him for dinner at the licorice lounge. Oh, you mean just for an evening of fun and laughs? That's right. No psychiatry, no psychology. It's a good idea. So good of you to come. <laughs> oh, sit down. There we are. Let me help you. I'm sorry I'm late. <laughs> what did you say, my dear? I said I'm sorry I'm late. Being sorry is a psychological manifestation of a deep-seated guilt complex. 
I don't feel guilty. I'm just sorry I kept you waiting. There's nothing wrong in keeping someone waiting. How long have you had this uh, inferiority complex neurosis? Hmm? Inferiority complex neurosis? Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. We all have little problems. We all have little psychoses, neuroses, fetishes. Don't worry, we're going to have fun tonight. Forget your problems. Waiter! Would Madam care to see a menu? No, thank you. I know what I want. You know what you want? Obviously, a defensive, regressive mechanism. Mm, obviously. Yes. Do you uh, mind if I uh, step in? Oh, I wish you'd help. May I ask you a question? Yes. Are you an only child? Yes, I was. An only child at table 43? <laughs> see, I see this as a problem table. It certainly is. You will stay close by, won't you? 24 hour call. Thank you. Mm. My dear, try very hard to forget about the fact that you're an only child. We're here to have fun. Let's order dinner. What would you I'd like? I'd like to. A uh, consomme, please. Consomme. Consomme. A small steak, medium rare. Small steak, medium rare. Medium rare. No potatoes. <laughs> you hear that? No mm. potatoes. What do you make of it? Well, potatoes suggest jackets. Jackets suggest clothes. He probably has a great fear of wearing clothes. <laughs> That's almost smart. Mm. Check it out. <laughs> My dear, do you really mean no potatoes? They're on the menu. I'm sorry, Freddie. No potatoes. Mm. That's the third time she said sorry. Three sorry? You're pulling my leg. No, no, I'm not. No, 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 no. No, no, she said it. She's, she's constantly apologizing. Been here three minutes, she's apologizing. Smells like guilt. Yes, Doc. Well, we know that, but why? I don't know why. There must be some way of finding out. Maybe I got an idea. I'll ask the chef. Will he know? He's from Vienna. Oh, good, good. <laughs> they know, they know. Listen, if she should make noise... Yes. Or light her hair on fire. Yes. And throw this water in her face. I know the treatment. I know the treatment. Please. Don't worry, my dear. You're going to be all right. Would you add a cigar? Oh, please. I'll have some cigarettes. Thank you. Oh, what a cute little bunny. This is a panda. Oh, oh, I thought it was a bunny. Why should you think a panda's a bunny? In this light, it looks just like it. Uh, I can see in this light. So can I. What's the matter? Are you suffering from a hypermanical tendency toward paranoid insecurity? What's all this fuss about? I mistook a panda for a bunny, that's all. That's, that's all. all. <laughs> well, I didn't mean anything by it. I'm sorry. The fourth time she said she's sorry. Wait a minute. I'll get your water later. I'm on a case. <laughs> How is she? She said sorry again. Poor sorry? Mm -hmm. Oh, poor sorry. What are we going to do? Well, I don't know. She's suffering from an acute case of polyunsaturated nervousness. I agree. I disagree. Consultation. Excuse me, my dear. Would you mind holding down the music? There's a sick woman at this table. What's the matter? <laughs> Dr. Brother. Dr. Oberdorfer, I'm so glad to see you. Doctor, I've come across the most interesting psychological phenomenon. Psychological phenomenon, my foot. But, Doctor... And I'm don't doctor me when I'm out of the office. Come on, Blondie. Let's twist. <laughs> Thank you for dropping in out there tonight. We hope you found this hour uh, in television kind of an oasis from the vast wasteland. Hope you've had a good time, and we will see you soon. Good night.